TSN's Motoring 95 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, the way it should be. So you're in the market to buy a brand new car. You want it small, and you don't want to spend any more than, oh, $16,500. But decisions, decisions with so many models out there. Well, have you come to the right place? And the place is the landing strip at the Deerhurst Resort in the Muskoka area of Northern Ontario. Now, Car Guide Magazine, the National Automotive Magazine, has brought together some of this country's leading automotive journalists to evaluate the class of 95. And we'll have that story later on. But first, we're going drag racing, high school style. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the things you should remember is that when you're racing, you're not racing the other car, you're racing yourself. You're going to dial in a handicap, say the handicap is 1550. The secret is to get down to the end of the quarter mile as quickly as you can. Do not go under that 1550 dial in. And if you've cut the lights the way they should be cut, you'll get to the other end, you will be the winner. The secret is consistency and being quick off the line. It's standard procedure to hold a driver's meeting prior to any race meet. But what made this gathering extraordinary was the fact that the drivers were all high school students. London Motorsports Park is the home for drag racing in southern Ontario. And students had come from as far away as Sudbury for what was being billed as the high school challenge. trying to reach some of the students that you don't reach through normal modes of education. Um, what we're trying to do is excite these kids about something and this, uh, this venue seems to be the excellent choice. What we do is we have, uh, we have high school students down here, most of them in their graduating years, um, coming down and testing tuning their cars. Um, we have the uh, police forces on board to show students the proper way to set up their car and stuff and that it's the racetrack is a place to be racing these vehicles and not on the streets so we're trying to promote safe driving education as well as um, honing motor skills for the students while they're in class. We have students involved in the business program to help us figure out costing. We have uh, students involved in the graphics to help us to do with uh, how to letter the car, um, color combinations, promotion, trying to locate sponsors to help us foot the tab um, so that uh, most of the cars that are here that are run by the schools um, is either sponsor money or teacher money. A lot of these cars that you see, most of them are built by students in the classroom. And I think that's some pr pretty phenomenal stuff. Now, is a winch a good idea when you come out to drag race? <laughs> well, it has been extra weight, but, but uh, I don't know. It's just a stock truck anyway. So. I've never done it before. I, I just, I, I like racing and that's why I come out today, but uh, my old man always told me, he says there was a time and a place for racing, that's why I come here. driving here? 81 Rabbit. And, and what's your top speed so far? 63 mile an hour. What do you think your chances are here? <laughs> Not very good. Okay, have a good one. Yep. It's a 1980 Chef Monza and it runs 10 ones on a good day and runs in the Super Pro class down here at London Motorsports. Normally when these kids are driving a car on the highway, the last thing they want to see is a man in uniform. What's it been like for you? It's been very interesting. Uh, I remember when I first started going into the high schools, they couldn't believe that a police officer was racing. Uh, since that time, it's become very very easy to talk to the kids and they, they're very receptive to what I'm doing. Now you are definitely not dressed like a race car driver. No. Checkered shorts, sandals. Uh, no. How old are you and what brings you out here? 17, high school drags, just out to have some fun. The car's not the fastest, but you know it's not the fastest, most consistent. That's what I've been doing all day, so that's about it. Whose car is it? My parents. What do they think it is? Oh, they don't know yet. 
They don't know. They'll find out when they get, when I get home with the trophy. You're in the final? Yeah. All right, good luck. Thanks. Also making the final, the 81 diesel Volkswagen Rabbit. Now remember, the handicap will give the Rabbit a head start. You just won the high school challenge in a 1981 diesel-powered Volkswagen Rabbit. People are shaking their heads. How'd you do it? I just kept driving it consistently the same all day. And I tried to keep the same reaction time and everything. What'd you pay for this car? I got about $400 tied up in the car. It's about $150 for the car. Did you really think that you'd come here and win this? No, I didn't even really come down to race. I just come down to watch. And I figured I'd run down the track a couple times to see what it would do. What's your next car going to be? Oh, I don't know. I'm probably still stick with Volkswagen. I don't know. This Mustang's got a lot of work to do to catch him, and it is the Volkswagen for the win. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. On this edition of Test Drive, we look at Suzuki's latest, their all-new Esteem, a vehicle they're touting as their first five-seater sedan. One of the things the new Esteem has going in its favor are its perky looks. The designers have done a good job in getting a balanced look that manages to retain some semblance of personality. Now, this is becoming a rarity for the Japanese. Just look at the Sentra. Bland is being polite. Under the hood is an all-aluminum 16-valve fuel-injected single-overhead cam engine that produces 98 horsepower and 96 pounds-feet of torque. Now, while the numbers are meager to say the least, the performance they yield certainly is not. Tromp the gas pedal from a standing start. The tires chirp and the response belies the number. The only drawback is the amount of noise the engine produces as you near its red line of 6,500 RPM. The other comment is that at idle, the engine sounds like a tin can filled with ball bearings. Suffice it to say, it is far from music to the ears. Match with the engine is a five-speed manual transmission that offers reasonable feel. The shift pattern is precise and the throw is fairly short. The one oddity is that the gear lever nods back and forth as you go on and off the gas. The clutch could do with a little refining. The take-up is less than progressive and it has a tendency to grab at times. That said, the gear ratios chosen certainly complement the engine's characteristics. Run up through the box and the engine stays well within the power band. All in all, not a bad little powertrain. The brake system is comprised of front discs and rear drums with a full four-wheel anti-lock system being an available option. The stops are straight and precise, requiring a tad over 113 feet to slow from 80k. The main comment here is that the Sumitomo ABS system is far too eager to intervene. Even with the perfect conditions encountered during the tests, I was into full ABS. The system should allow the driver a lot more latitude before it starts poking its nose in. The suspension features McPherson struts and coil springs at all four corners, plus a roll bar at the front only. During the pylon test, the car tracked a fairly good line with understeer only showing up when the car is really pushed. That said, the one thing I did notice is that if you lift off the gas during the transition from left to right, you induce trailing throttle oversteer. This is a condition whereby because of the engine braking you are applying to the front wheels, it makes the rear wheels want to take the lead. Now I stress that this only happens during hard and fast maneuvers, but it's a tendency I found a little disconcerting. Now adding a rear sway bar may help to tame this aspect of the handling characteristics. Out on the road, the Esteem handles itself very nicely. The majority of the road irregularities are handled in stride, and the ride comfort afforded by the suspension is better than one expects to find in a small car. All in all, the road manners are what they should be. The interior of the Esteem has been very well thought through. The power door locks and windows fall readily to hand, as do the power mirrors and the main cruise control on-off switch. The levers on either side of the steering column are easily reached and accessed whilst holding the steering wheel. There's a great set of analog instrumentation and the radio sits in the right place, although true to the rest of Suzuki's vehicles, the Clarion unit features very small and fiddly buttons. The climate controls are easily accessed unless you're in fifth, which partially blocks the recirculating air lever. 
Now those are the highlights. The letdown, well it's quite simply the very cheap interior plastics used throughout. That and this very cheap coffee cup holder. There's not enough tea in China would make me put a hot cup of coffee in that, making it a redundant option. The Esteem features remote releases for both the fuel door and the trunk. The leftover is cut to bumper level and you'll find a split folding rear seat which adds the level of versatility required. The rear environment of the Esteem has been equally well thought out. There's plenty of tow room beneath the front seat, an abundance of knee room and ample headroom. Now while Suzuki advertised this as a five passenger, and there are five sets of seat belts, I for one would not want to sit three abreast on a long trip. On the safety front, the Suzuki scores well if it does come at a rather high price. You'll find three-point seat belts in all outboard positions, adjustable upper seat belt anchors and child-proof rear door locks, as well as dual airbags. Anti-lock brakes are an available option. Well, that wraps up another test drive. You know, Suzuki have done a good job with the Esteem. It's got a nice engine, it handles reasonably well, it's got quite a lot of space, but above all, it comes with a lot of safety equipment. The downside, the very cheap plastics used throughout the interior. The latest tip of the week concerns proper reinstallation of the wheel lug nuts on your vehicle. On many of today's vehicles, you simply can't go wrong in this operation, thank goodness. For example, on this particular wheel, you can see that the wheel nuts are closed on the outside, so they only thread on in the correct fashion with the conical part of the wheel nut facing the wheel. However, if your vehicle has a more conventional wheel tire assembly, like this standard steel wheel right here, which would have a, a full wheel disc or a hubcap covering the nuts, you're going to have a setup something like this. The wheel studs, when you install the wheel, project through like that, and you have to install the wheel nut in one of two positions. Now, there is only one correct position, and it's very important that you find it. The conical or tapered part of that wheel nut must face the conical seat on that rim in order for the wheel nut to lock in properly. If you put it on backwards, it won't tighten down properly. You'll get pinpoint contact, and within 50 or 100 miles, it'll chew its way loose, probably ruin the wheel, ruin the wheel stud and the wheel nut, and if you're extremely unlucky, the wheel could easily detach from the vehicle. And when you're finished and you get that tire repaired and put back on the vehicle, ask your mechanic to tighten down those wheel lugs with a torque wrench. That's your Midas tip of the week. Well, as you can see, I am literally standing in the middle of a runway. Hey, nobody ever accused me of being bright, but there's a reason for all this. As I mentioned off the top of the program, this is the runway at the Deerhurst Resort up in the Muskokas in Northern Ontario. And this is the site that the automotive magazine Car Guide has selected to evaluate the small car class of 1995. In a joint venture between Motoring 95 and Car Guide magazine, some of Canada's top automotive journalists assembled to compare economy cars with a price tag of 16.5 or under. The Nissan Sentra, the Cavalier and Sunfire from General Motors, the Chrysler Neon, Ford Escort, Volkswagen Golf, Suzuki Esteem, and Hyundai Accent. Well, uh, there is no business that's as competitive uh, as the car business, and the manufacturers are all uh, striving to demonstrate that their vehicle is, is somewhat better than the competition. And all of these vehicles have things to recommend them. There's no question about that. So I think that the manufacturers today are happy to take part in exercises like this because all of the vehicles will show um, some virtues that they can take advantage of. Many of the tests were quite grueling and not something consumers would attempt. So how relevant is the exercise? Uh, some of it may not relate directly. Not very many people do 0 to 100 uh, accelerations. But the way we do it, unlike some others, was a street start. So it was no revving up the engine and with your foot on the brake and accelerating hard that way. It was just the way you'd pull away from a stop street. So it does give a relative comparison of the acceleration ability of the cars. 80 to 120 is the kind of thing you'd uh, use for passing on a two-lane road so yes there is some relevance and and from the other things perhaps the numbers themselves are not all that significant but they do help us in uh, translating what we feel into what's happening with the cars 
You'll notice that some of the Japanese aren't uh, represented here. The protege, the good protege, or the good version of the protege, uh, is too expensive, and they didn't want to put the S in because they didn't think it would fare very well against the other competition. Uh, Toyota couldn't squeeze the Corolla in underneath the 16.5, and the Tercel would have been out of its depth, and Honda just plain and simply declined. Um, there's rumor that there's a new Civic coming, but I still think they should have had an entrant in because uh, if you look at the Golf, it's fared very well here today, and it's had a very long life cycle in terms of model years available. If you had to drive one home, which one would it be? Ah, if I had to drive one home, uh, I stand by my choice of the Accent as one of the best uh, economy cars. But if I were taking one vehicle home, I think I would probably go with the Sentra, purely and simply because of the reputation it has for longevity, reliability, and the whole nine yards. Nissan Sentra. Perhaps not the best in any one category, but I think it's the most refined and the best balanced of them all. Um, I think I'd drive the Sunfire home, and funnily enough, I drove up in the Sunfire, and I wasn't quite sure you know, how it would compare to the others, but having driven all the others, um, it, it's got better and better as I've gone along. Actually, uh, I'd like to take the Sunfire home. I, I think I could be very happy with that. Uh, it would have to be the, uh, the Golf. Um, I wrote a little while ago about that car and said if you can't afford a BMW, this is the next best thing. And out of the eight vehicles here, it, it most closely matches what I like in a small car. The others are uh, quite impressive and really shows how well they've developed this class of car over the years, but uh, yeah, that's still my favorite. So it appears the Nissan Sentra has the majority of votes in the small car category. Of course, nobody asked me what I think. But again, the program's not over yet, which is just as well because we're heading to the garage to join Bill Gardner. In the past eight or ten years, the distributor has gone by the wayside in many of today's smaller front-wheel drive cars. However, on sport utility trucks, vans, full-size pickup trucks, even many mini pickup trucks, for example, still have distributors even on current production vehicles today. So it's still something that needs to be looked at occasionally in service. Now, in the middle 70s, when electronic ignition systems came out, the need to service distributors was greatly reduced. And as electronic engine controls came along, replacing things like centrifugal advancers and vacuum advancers, traditional parts that were housed on the distributor, as those things disappeared, the need to, dis to uh, service the distributor shrunk once again, to the point where we as mechanics almost forgot about that particular item at tune-up intervals. And we found in the last few years, we're starting to see vehicles coming in now where this particular component has been uh, neglected to the point where the vehicle will hardly even run. So we need to uh, rethink some of our service uh, procedures on those vehicles. And the one I want to talk about in particular is late model GM uh, vans and pickup trucks. What I've got here is the distributor cap that up until a week or two ago was on this particular uh, pickup truck. Now what, what tends to happen with this particular application, the vans and pickup trucks with the V8 engines, is that uh, these terminals in here, the cap terminals that uh, go to the respective cylinders of this eight-cylinder engine, the terminals in this cap are extremely small. And there's an, a certain amount of erosion that takes place at that terminal every time uh, that cylinder, that particular cylinder fires. That's a normal condition. But because these terminals are so small, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of erosion of that terminal to uh, render this cap uh, non-functional. And in many cases, we've had these trucks come in where the cap terminals are almost uh, completely sheared off or missing as a result of that normal wear and tear that takes place inside the distributor. Now, uh, also, the material that this distributor cap is made of is not a particularly good insulator, and the terminals themselves are made of aluminum, which tends to corrode a little bit in service. It's a normal condition. Now, in this particular application, the need for a heavy-duty part was uh, quite obvious. And in the aftermarket, one particular manufacturer picked up on that and uh, has been producing a heavy-duty cap for a number of years now. And if you have one of these uh, vehicles, as I mentioned, you might want to think when it comes uh, tune-up time to think about replacing with a heavy-duty part like this because you'll have some significant gains that can be made, uh, certainly on, uh, on damp or humid days. You'll notice uh, a big improvement in the way your vehicle runs. What they've done is they've made the uh, entire body of the distributor cap out of a different type of plastic that's dielectrically 
quite a bit stronger. In other words, in layman's terms, it's a much better insulator. This blue material is a much better insulator. The terminals themselves are made of brass now, so they're not subject to nearly the corrosion that they used to be. Now, they still have to be physically the same size to work on this particular installation, because obviously they have to interface with all the stock or original equipment parts on that vehicle. But this particular distributor cap is only seven or eight dollars more uh, expensive than, uh, than the stock or original equipment counterpart, but it offers much greater uh, life expectancy and much better performance on damp days. You know, as a rule, I'm a stickler for original equipment parts, but in this one particular application, distributor caps and rotors, there's some significant gains to be had by putting heavy duty aftermarket parts on in replacement of those OE parts. Certainly if you live near either coast in this country or anywhere near the Great Lakes, any large body of water, you get a lot of days with high relative humidity, you're going to get much better performance on those foggy, damp, wet days with the heavy duty parts versus the stock parts. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 95. It's a good looking truck, but is it a good truck? We've got some powerful numbers next on Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. J.D. Power, or David as his friends know him, may be the single most influential person in the entire car business. He's elevated market research into a marketing art form, and a good result in the Power survey is invariably translated into a multi-million dollar ad campaign. Now, David also uses these numbers to evaluate car factories by cross-referencing the car results with the places where they're built. These numbers turn out to be a good news, bad news situation for Canadian car workers. The good news? Well, the Toyota Corolla plant in Cambridge, Ontario is ranked as the best plant in all of North America, with an average of 62 faults per 100 cars. Now, don't go thinking that 62% of all Corollas blow up in the first three months of operation. These faults can be as minor as a little ding in the paint or a little flaw in the upholstery. Interestingly, the way I interpret these data, the Corollas built in Japan aren't as good as the ones that are built in Cambridge. Now, at the risk of sounding like Don Cherry, Way to go, Cambridge! Now, the bad news is that with the possible exception of a handful of Volvos, there's not a single Canadian-built car in the top 10. Now, does this mean that the guys screwing together Fords, GMs, Chryslers, Hondas, and Volvos aren't doing as good a job as the guys in Cambridge? Well, I don't think so. I mean, Cambridge doesn't have a corner on good workers. What it does mean is that Toyota has a spectacular production system. They build good cars everywhere they build cars. Now, Chrysler, for example, is doing a great job of designing cars like this new minivan, but they may still have a thing or two to learn about assembly quality from the likes of Toyota. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, the small car evaluation is winding up at Lakeside, and you know, I've got to admit, I'm just a little miffed. We've heard everybody's opinion, but nobody's asked me which car I would pick. Stop, Stop whining and, and tell us. us. Well, now that you ask, I did like the Sunfire a lot and was surprised at how different and how much better it was than its sibling, the Cavalier. But the bottom line, I gotta go along with Bob English. The Golf is the vehicle that I'd like to take home. I know it doesn't have ABS. I know it doesn't have airbags. In Volkswagen, it should. But I've been driving half my life without those features. And the bottom line is the Golf is a fun car to drive. And unlike a lot of economy cars, I don't think after a couple of years of living with it, that boredom would set in. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 95 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, the way it should be.